Jesse, wake up. It's Sunday morning and we haven't filmed a greeting yet. Mm -hmm. I brought you some coffee. Thank you. <clears throat> right. Um, well, welcome to worship with St. Paul and St. Andrew. I'm Jesse. Uh, I live in the Parsonage. And here is me welcoming you to this beautiful service. <laughs> Anyways, I just wanted to say I know that virtual church and this whole pandemic has been very challenging. Um, it's been a different method for us, really. But um, instead of focusing on the negative, I wanted to focus on the positive just for a couple seconds. So, um, as you know, the parsonage is right next to the church. But yet, like my entire life, I've still found that commute really challenging. As you see, it's really hard for me to wake up in the morning and stuff, need a lot of coffee. So um, I'm just grateful that now my commute has been cut basically directly in half because all I got to do is go downstairs. Still an effort, but you know, I'm willing to make it for you all. Um, another great benefit of these virtual online services is that, guess what? I get to go to Connect and Care in my pajamas and like honestly I have some great pajamas we spent a long time talking about uh, my pajamas in our last connecting care meeting so really a highlight I just wanted to say welcome to service this is a beautiful vibrant creative fun community I'm glad you're joining us I'm glad to be here myself probably as you're watching this I'm like pretty bleary-eyed and like just woken up vibes anyways so many people put a lot of effort into these services, and I just wanted to say shout out to them. There's literally three cameras filming me right now. So much effort, so much talent, so much beauty. And um, this is my friend Sam. He's a dolphin. I've had him for a very long time. And he, um, coffee. He's really excited because he's been preparing a, like a little clap for you all. Um, and as you can see, he has a little challenge in the whole clapping department. But he's ready. He's ready. Don't worry. Okay. Yes! Welcome to worship! Please join us for the call to worship from Psalm 104. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and, and let, let every part of me bless God's, God's holy name. name. God, how amazing are your creatures! In, In wisdom, wisdom you, you have, have made, made them, them all. all. When you send forth your Spirit, they have life. And, and you, you renew, renew the, the face of the earth. earth. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will praise, praise my, my God, God while I, I have breath. breath. May our meditations today be pleasing to God. As we, as we rejoice, rejoice in, in the peace of God and, and the justice of Jesus. Jesus. Sing a song of peace for the nations of the earth. And, and may, may God's peace bring an end to violence, injustice, and strife. Sing a song of hope for, for all the people on earth. earth.
Will you pray with me? Holy One, you call us to find your kingdom already hidden in our world, in tiny transforming possibilities, in beauty that calls us to surrender all, in complicated choices that call for wisdom. Reveal yourself here in this moment and heighten our senses that we may find you and join you in building this kingdom of love and hope and peace. In the name of the one who calls us to seek, Jesus. Amen. scripture reading today comes from Revelation chapter 5. Then I saw in the right hand of the one seated on the throne a scroll written on the inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep bitterly, because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw between the throne and the four living creatures, and among the elders, a lamb, standing as if it had been slaughtered, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of the one who was seated on the throne. Then I saw the lamb open one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures call out as with the voice of thunder, Come! I looked, and there was a white horse. Its rider had a bow, a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature call out, Come! And out came another horse, bright red, its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people would slaughter one another. And he was given a great sword. This is a word of uncovering. Thanks, Thanks be, to be to God. I saw in the hand of the one on the throne a scroll sealed with seven stars on that shone. scroll to reveal the lion of Judah shall open the seals. Then I saw the lamb open up the first seal, and I looked to observe what would then be revealed. A rider with bow and a crown was a light, a conquering foe. Continue the scripture reading from Revelation chapter 5. When the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature call out, Come! I looked, and there was a black horse. Its rider held a pair of scales in his hand, and I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a day's pay, 
and three quarts of barley for a day's pay. But do not damage the olive oil and the wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature call out, Come! I looked and there was a pale green horse. A pale green horse? Its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed with him. They were giving authority over the fourth of the earth to kill with sword, famine, and pestilence, and by the wild animals of the earth. This is a word of uncovering. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Scripture reading continues with chapter 8 of the book of Revelation. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel with a golden censer came and stood at the altar. The angel was given a great quantity of incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar that is before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder and rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets made ready to blow them. The first angel blew a trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and they were hurled to the earth, and a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. The second angel blew a trumpet, And something like a great mountain, burning with fire, was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea became blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died. And a third of the ships were destroyed. A third angel blew the trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on all of the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, bitter and poisonous, and many died from the water because it was made bitter. Then I looked, and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice, as if in mid-heaven, Whoa! 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 To the inhabitants of the earth at the blast of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. This is a word of uncovering. Thanks Thanks be to God.
Today's message is brought to us by Dr. Katherine Keller. Dr. Keller is a professor of constructive theology at Drew University. She needs a little introduction around this church because she's a, been a member of St. Paul and St. Andrew since the mid-1990s and frequently helps us to understand difficult things about Christian tradition, in particular, those questions that come up through any reading of the book of Revelation, that often misunderstood and misinterpreted part of Christian scripture. Today, Dr. Keller will see what light can be shed by these mysterious passages from this book of, of uncovering, of revealing, and what it can tell us about our current health crisis, our planetary crisis, and our political and social crisis. Without further ado, here's Dr. Keller. Good morning, church. It has been a comfort to gather with you, even in this online way, for months, and to imagine sometime in the future some handshakes, maybe even some hugs. In the meantime, in this mean time of crisis, I thought it was an important moment to take on an ancient text of crisis, the good old apocalypse. Of course, in a progressive community like SPSA, you do not often get subjected to the book of Revelation. And I suspect you don't expect to hear any update on the timing of the end times, the tribulations, or when you will be left behind if you aren't raptured or how God's chosen president is preparing the way for the Lord's return for that. Read Anderson and McGuire's 2018 book, Trumpocalypse. I apologize for such end time associations. But it's really John of Potmos, the author of the book of Revelation, who is owed an apology. No book in history has been more grossly misread and misused Revelation is the translation of John's Greek word, apocalypsis. Yet most people think apocalypse means the end of the world, period. Really big period. Really big mistake. Apocalypse means literally to unveil. It was originally used for the unveiling of the bride on her wedding night. So yes, this is a word of unveiling. Apocalypsis does not mean the closing of the world, it's closed down, but it's disclosure, a great eye opening, taking the veil off our vision, clearing our eyes. Not that what we then see is pretty. In John's vision, much of the world does end in destruction. And for John, that meant the Roman Empire, which had colonized the known world. The unveiling is hyper-dramatized in John's vision. It's mirrored in the opening of a scroll in heaven and the opening of the scroll's seven seals. In his altered state of consciousness, John is weeping in an agony of suspense to learn what is in that scroll, the scroll within the scroll that he is writing. He is then reassured that it will be opened by the lion, the royal symbol of his people's hope for the Meshiach, the Messiah. And without any explanation, it's instead the lamb that shows up, quite the opposite of the fierce nobility of the lion. This lamb is drenched in the blood of his own slaughter and yet is somehow alive. Messianic violence is replaced by messianic nonviolence. The Union theologian James Cohn, who is much missed in this community, would call that the difference between Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. But we are not going to reopen every one of John's seven seals today, not even all of the first four, though each one of them <laughs> has a horse thundering through, but it's the fourth horse, the pale green one, that has been demanding human attention. I have been finishing a book called Facing Apocalypse, Climate, Democracy, and Other Last Chances. 
But my early draft had ignored this fourth horse, the one who rides across the world carrying the horseman of death, killing by sword, famine, attacks by wild animals, and pestilence. And suddenly, he came galloping across the world in earliest spring, when life is shooting up in pale green seedlings, the pale green horse of pestilence thundered right into New York City. Not that John had been predicting COVID-19, no. Though if you feed COVID-19 Book of Revelation into the Google search engine, it will spit out almost 40 million results for you. But the history of pandemics proper does begin soon after John's death with the Antonine Plague of 165 of the Christian epoch. His readers could understandably hear him as foreseeing that one, which took out five million people, including much of the Roman army. Pestilence has returned over and over as pandemic. So prophecy is not prediction of one event now, it's more like the discernment of systemic patterns in our civilization, which is in many ways still the same civilization as John's. Prophecy intuits patterns so entrenched that they're likely to return often and dangerously, maybe even now. John is not predicting events in our time, but we in our time can dream read his metaphors as relevant to our time. Dream reading, that's the alternative to literal reading. So you might ask, what does this pestilence have to do with the pale green horse's other offerings? Violence, hunger, and animal attacks. Well, during our pandemic, Food insecurity has risen exponentially among racially marked and economically oppressed U.S. populations, the folk most vulnerable also to the virus. And by the way, the prior horse is all about economic injustice. Its rider held a pair, pair of scales in his hand, and I heard what seemed to be a voice saying, a quart of wheat for a day's pay and three quarts of barley for a day's pay, but do not damage the olive oil and the wine. That voice is sarcastically vocalizing the economic injustice of antiquity. How can people live if they can just get a bit of grain for a whole day's pay? To hell with them, but don't hurt the olive oil and the wine, which were luxury products of global trade. In other words, the third horseman wreaks the destruction of economic oppression. Back to the horse four. Is it mere coincidence that with the unveiling of economic disparities by our current pestilence, a specific sword was also revealed? Police violence against African Americans? Well, okay, but you might ask, what does this have to do with the other thing on the fourth horse's back? Attacks by wild animals. Sounds like a very antique problem. And yet, the likeliest cause of COVID-19 seems to be transmission from bats, pangolins, from wild animals, not meaning to attack us, but delivering the virus. Human disregard for non-humans and their habitats has long boded ill. Hence, the pandemic is recognized as not a human but an ecological disease. As one scientist writes, a number of researchers today think that it is actually humanity's destruction of biodiversity that creates the conditions for new viruses like COVID-19 to arise with profound health and economic impacts. In fact, he continues, a new discipline, planetary health is emerging that focuses on the increasingly visible connections among the well-being of humans, other living things, and entire ecosystems. So planetary health is in apocalypse. The unhealth is unveiled. 
And if we have eyes to see, we recognize that our world is suffering from environmental illness. Stress the mental, for it does seem to be a collective mental illness that closes human eyes to climate change with its absolute threat to our species near future, ever nearer future. Can you see the pale green of pandemic now blurring eerily into the fading green of our whole planet? And soon in the book of Revelation, we arrive at the moment of terrible suspense before the opening of the seventh seal. 30 minutes of silence is held in heaven. Let us hold it for three seconds. And then amidst deafening percussion, the timpani of thunder quakes, the septet of seven angels steps up. And lucky for you, there is no time for me to play for you the whole trumpet by trumpet devastation. But it is crucial that we realize that the first three blasts are all about environmental collapse. The first, a third of the trees were burned up. Does your mind like mine flash to California, Australia, Brazil, just over the past year, millions of acres of trees burnt? The trees that provide so much of our oxygen that draw down excess carbon? the second blast, and the sea turns bloody, toxic, a third of sea life dies. Are we there yet? More than a third of the coral reefs that support the sea life have recently died, and the phytoplankton at the bottom of the food chain are now threatened by ocean acidification. I learned recently a spooky fact about phytoplankton. Don't hear much about this. They provide between 50% and 85% of our oxygen. So if we don't stop the warming, mass suffocation at the end of this century is a real possibility. That possibility gives a haunting planetary echo to George Floyd's, I can't breathe. I said, possibility, not inevitability. Amidst all the losses, the close downs of life, the apocalypse means to disclose the hope for radical change, the ancient Jewish prophetic hope for the new creation, not big daddy in heaven making us a new earth after we ruin this one, but a deep, divinely inspirited renewal of our shared human and non-human life, an age of enlivenment. We still have a chance to change course as a nation and so as a planet, to stop even worse burning, toxification, overheating. The earth is running a fever and it's getting worse just as, weirdly, almost 15 million humans are running the pandemic fever. Just a symbolic connection. But no, John was not foreseeing global warming or any of the facts of the 21st century. John was dream reading a dangerous tendency. For ancient prophets like him, the life of human civilization was never separable from the life of the creation in planetary health or illness. I will spare you any more detail from the trumpet septet. The fresh water is poisoned next, and there follows all manner of world trumping. Not because God wills it, not because God wants it or causes it, God grieves it as voiced in the poignant cry of the eagle. Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Woe, uai in the Greek does not mean curse. It means lament. 
we have as a world, as a nation, so much to grieve. Some, some of us, much more than others. And maybe the grief work of the apocalypse helps us face collective trauma, past, present, and future. Trauma, natural and cultural, economic, racial, ecological. By grieving, we can face, and by facing, we can change. And as you know, the book of Revelation does dream read a very dreamy ending with the new Jerusalem coming down beautiful and festive and God also coming down to earth to dwell among us. It is not a supernatural heaven of an ending, but a down to earth renewal. It's not about afterlife, but all the nations, the nations, coming through the gates, gates that are open 24-7. Disclosure, not closure, not walling up. Eye-openingly gorgeous. The metaphors of apocalypse remain potent metaphors. What matters is reading them responsibly so as to intensify our ability to respond to all the injustice, all the unhealth in our time, when a livable future depends upon a critical mass of us, a critical mass of us facing the worldwide destruction and taking responsibility, demanding responsibility, even though most of us, most of you are not the ones to blame. No, we humans are utterly unequal in our culpability. And yet we remain all tangled together in the ever more interdependent effects of our inequality, pandemic and ecological. Why, why, why calls out that eagle? Still, there is redemption in recognizing our interdependence. There is apocalyptic disclosure, opening eyes, opening possibilities, opening lives amidst so many, many closures. So here is what I pray for each of you, you each, in every moment of unveiling, of eye-opening, frightening or festive, in the name of the creativity, the love and the breath of life itself. Go forth in the spirit of life, the spirit that breathes in every creature of this radiant creation and breathes through you, you right now, all that you do and all that you are and all that you are becoming. It all matters. I love you, SPSA, you ministers, you congregation, you people of God. Amen.
to bless and sanctify to thee thy deepest distress. Please join me in prayer. God of righteousness, thank you for meeting us here for worship once again. This morning, we pause to reflect on the ways you have moved in our lives and the charge being called by you places within us. We thank you for the openings your radical revelation brings. Sometimes the burden of being called by you can feel heavy. The weight of the world can grow heavy and make it hard for us to stay grounded in you. There's so much to be concerned about. Climate crisis, political woes, rampant racism, our current pandemic. May your radical righteousness rain down on us. Let us be quick to seek correction and forgiveness when we are wrong. When in deep waters, let us look first to you for direction and guidance. As we seek good and not evil, may we remain rooted in you, O God. May we stand up against systemic evil as your son Jesus modeled for us, a life ministry that demonstrated love as well as justice. May your heart for righteousness and concern for the overlooked continue to flow through us as we care for one another. As we rejoice in the peace of God and the justice of Jesus, keep us sensitive to the new ways you may be directing our path. You, God, are the mighty good leader. We trust in you and your plan. In your name we pray. Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. love-inspired action and social justice. For us, that welcome is lived out by feeding people. We're proud to be members of a church where the sanctuary may not be available for Sunday worship because the pews are filled with food and the church is being used to feed a thousand people a day. The church has dedicated leadership and hard-working members, but to carry out its mission, it also takes money. And that's, that's why, why we, we give. give. You've all been so generous and faithful and creative in finding ways to give to this church and its mission. We hope that you'll be able to continue to help. Here are varieties of, of ways to give either online or by writing a check and sending it in that old fashioned way. We're beginning a final push to finish the roof project and if you are able to give to that project in addition we would be very very grateful
Change my heart, O oh God. We leave you now with these words that were spoken by Malcolm X to the students gathered in Selma, Alabama, before the Great March. Malcolm said, I pray that God will bless you in everything you do. I pray that you will grow intellectually so that you can understand the problems of the world and where you fit into that world picture. And I pray that the fear, all the fear that has ever been in your heart will be taken out. Go in peace. God bless you as we follow Jesus. Jesus is a mighty good leader. Jesus lead you, let Jesus lead you, let Jesus lead you all the way, all the way from earth to heaven. Let Jesus lead you all the way. He led my elders, he led my elders, he led my elders oh, all the way. All the way from earth to heaven, let Jesus lead you all the way. siblings. He led my siblings. He led my siblings all the way. All the way from earth to heaven. Let Jesus lead you all the way. He's a mighty good leader. He's a mighty good leader. He's a mighty good leader all the way. All the way from earth to heaven, let Jesus lead you all the way. Let Jesus lead you all the
Jesse, wake up.